throughout history, the men and women who lead us with new concepts, new ideas. Help us all to move forward in thought toward brighter tomorrows. And now, Meetings with Remarkable People, with your host, Jesse Sterling. Welcome to a very special episode of Meetings with Remarkable People. We are here in Kulu Valley, the Valley of the Gods in the high Himalayas, India, Himanchal Pradesh. Very, very special guest today. Amaramham Madhuramham. My name is Mary Lieberg and Swamiji gave me the beautiful name Meera, which I love very much. I'm 61 years old been brought up in Montreal and I was born in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean on a ship. Um, yes, my hobbies. I do, I always liked walking, uh, swimming, liked also drawing, reading about the metaphysical realm, knowing something that's beyond the human waking state consciousness. Mainly was looking for my guru my whole life. That's what I really was doing. I've been meditating ever since I met Swamiji. Before I met Swamiji, I tried to meditate many times, but I was unsuccessful. It didn't have any result, didn't have any meaning. But after meeting Swamiji, meditation became part of my life. Uh, just as breathing, eating, walking, talking, studying is, well, meditation is a very important part of my life now. And it is actually part of everyone's life, but not everyone is aware of it. So it remains neglected. And therefore, people have something missing in them because it's an aspect of themselves which is not being fulfilled. But once meditation is introduced and is practiced, then an empty void begins to be filled with the life and the awareness of the pure free forever awareness. And even though my mom had a guru, I knew that my guru was somewhere, somewhere I still had to find. And whoever I met, I would look in their eyes, are you my guru, are you my guru, are you my guru? The feeling was he's still to be found. So there's a system that your elders have made it that if you are a young person, you earn and you use it. So I'll not at this time say all that what a human being is, what for he is, what he should do, where he should be, all those things you already know. I want to be very specific at this time where I am sitting at 9,000 feet high on the Himalayas. I met Swamiji after hearing him on Shom, on uh, Jeff Sterling's radio station, which was uh, helpful to so, so many of us and I'm ever thankful to that. And Swamiji was talking, but my experience first was of his wonderful divine laughter. Even to me, have you ever thought that I'm not born? If I'm not born, then why would I die? <laughs> I was in the kitchen, in the dining room with my mom on a Sunday morning and the sun was streaming in, but we were quarreling over something, over my French lessons, I think. We were quarreling and suddenly my hand shot like this to the side and went to the radio dial and was turning it frantically. And I myself was wondering, why am I doing this? because the radio was broken and I had not brought it to the repairman which I was supposed to have done two, three days previously. But luckily the radio went on, it clicked on 
and my hand then went to the dial and was turning it and turning it as if it was destined to go on a certain channel at a certain time beyond my mental understanding and it kept turning till it stopped and at that point the most beautiful laughter I've ever heard the most beautiful laugh sound in the whole universe came from there and it filled the whole room it was like peals of golden little little bells and sunshine streaming into the room it was so utterly beautiful that my mom and I totally stopped quarreling we didn't know what that beautiful sound was then right after that sound which was like brought peace brought wonder amazement in the whole room we heard Swamiji say this human incarnation is very very precious and even gods and goddesses are hankering to get an incarnation. And this struck me because I didn't know why gods and goddesses would want to have a human incarnation. They're already in the realm of the heavens with all their celestial powers and delights and wonder. So having found out that the human being has a, is of great value because I didn't think human beings were of such great value. In my days there was great uh, political unrest and there were great problems in the war world, wars as they are now also. And I thought why there's so much struggle, even family problems, family competition, family expectations and uh, then, then there's the educational system and then the social obligations and even all the uh, holidays and national holidays and you're always having to perform and do something and uh, I didn't quite relate to it because why are so many people unhappy? Why are there so many broken hearts? Why are there so I think broken hearts find their way home if they have someone to guide them. Because on their own, they only got that much. We can only do as much as we have done, as much as we do do. Otherwise, we would do more. So unless someone is there to give guidance and give knowledge to us, to give us that surplus energy, to give us that extra knowledge, that extra lift, that extra inspiration, that extra energy, uh, we just stay broken. One can try to get out of it, but usually it goes back again. So that ideal of perfection is needed in order to get to that state of oneness, of being the whole. Don't go anywhere. Meditation might just change your life. You're going to learn more about how to do it right after this. Welcome back to Meetings with Remarkable People. Very, very special episode today coming to you from India. Our guest is a meditation teacher. Then later on, Swamiji said that this human incarnation is very, very precious. And even gods and goddesses are hankering to have the human incarnation. I was baffled by this. I, my mind was so struck by his words that I didn't even hear the rest of his marvelous talk. It just struck me, why is this human incarnation that precious, that rare, that wonderful, that divine beings would, are waiting to take an incarnation as a human being. There must be something in our human existence that I'm not aware of. Because why is in this world filled with peace, harmony and love? So uh, when he said that, I began to question. I began to want to know more. Why is it that precious? And later on Swamiji said, this human incarnation is so precious because we have a nervous system with which we can meditate. And one can find ultimate peace, ultimate happiness, 
ultimate state of ease only if one meditates and opens that channel, that fourth channel, that channel of consciousness in which there's no waking state, no dream state, no deep sleep state. Rather, it is the state of pure consciousness, pure, free, forever awareness. And a human being, with our intellect, our mind, our nervous system, we are so fortunate that with proper guidance, we are able to then open that channel and come to know that pure consciousness which is our own true nature. But then I found the secret, the key, which gave meaning to my life, which is that there's work to be done. There's a special work to be done called sadhana, and that is the work that will bring one to enlightenment. And that work I embarked on after meeting Guruji. We hear the word enlightened state, enlightenment. We always are sitting in the sun, or we always wake up in the morning and see the sun and see the light. Yet each human being, when he becomes grown up, and if he is able to inquire after reading and studying, he inquires as to what is that which is enlightened state. A sleepy man does not inquire. A man who le has left the body, he does not inquire. Thus, those people who are in the state of sleep or in the state of matter only or dead, they cannot inquire about enlightenment. So even when man is knowing the light of the sun as against it the night in the night the darkness and the night, he thinks the word light pertains to this light, that if he remains in the sun, he will have more enlightened, be, become more enlightened. Or he opens his big eyes and sees the sun, more light will go and he will be enlightened. So in, enlightenment is a concept with all human beings. If he questions what is enlightenment, and we have to find out as to why does he question. Suppose he knows already light and he is enlightened in the waking state and he sees the light even in the dream state. Many times in the dream, the sun is there and you are traveling on the mountains, in the ocean swimming. But still he wants to inquire about what light is and nobody gives the answer to it as to what is that which he wants to ask. Maybe highly evolved scientists and doctors, they can see the nerves, but they don't say how the knowledge functions, from where does it come? How the nerves give the knowledge of waking state? How the nerves produce the knowledge of deep sleep? How the nerves bring about the dream figures and the knowledge of dream figures? And how the nerves, they reduce knowledge into dust. So, the enlightened state is not the light of the sun. An enlightened state is not the human intellect and mind and ego. Enlightened state, if it has not appeared in a human being on the level of his center of the intellect or knowledge, man will never become enlightened. We are taking an amazing journey of self-discovery and perhaps even self-enlightenment. Don't go anywhere. We are going to continue. 
Welcome back to Meetings with Remarkable People. Yes, this, this is a um, Gita verse uh, which Swamiji gave us from the very beginning when we met him. And he taught it to us in the most wonderful way. And um, well, the, t uh, the meaning is that the self, our own true nature, it's totally free. It's pure, free, forever. And it says that w no weapon can hurt it because uh, our true nature is pure consciousness, it's pure space, pure awareness. No weapon can hurt it because it's finer than any weapon. And also, there, no fire can ever burn it because fire doesn't burn space. Uh, fire doesn't, can't burn knowledge. Knowledge or your awareness is always pure and free. And wind, water cannot wet it. It can't be drowned because it's, it's uh, prior to all the elements. It's finer than all the elements, than water. And fire and wind can never destroy it no matter what great storm can come or what great hurricane or a tornado but no wind can ever touch it because wind never hurts the space can never destroy the space and consciousness is finer than the space because consciousness is that with which we know the space and if we can reach that state of way of awareness there the complete ease, the complete rest exists. And this verse is designed in such a way that it's written in Sanskrit. And the Sanskrit now, now language is, uh, sa is having sounds that are called Dev Nagri. They come from that heavenly lok. They come from the source space itself. They're very pure sounds. And in the repetition of these sounds, then the whole mental being, the whole mental sheath gets purified and all those other sounds that we've heard such as, oh, I'm, I, uh, I'm, I'm not worthy, I'm not great, I'm upset, I'm depressed, I'm not living up to standards, I'm not capable of being as great as my friends are, or any negative thought that may come, I'm going to die. I'm, even though there's nothing wrong at this time, but the thought can come, this world's going to come to an end. And all such thoughts come and leave their impressions on the human mind. And it leaves a negative force, a, neg a negative energy. So by repeating this verse, which is of pure knowledge, then all those mental vibrations get purified. And it becomes our our, our ray of knowledge which will go through the darkest of minds and bring forth that awareness of pure, of the pure being. So the verse goes, Nainam chintanti shastrani, Nainam dahati pavakaha, Nachainam klei deyanti apo, Nasho shayati marutaha. And we can chant it. Nainam chintanti shastrani, Nainam dahati pavakaha, Nachainam kleiteyanti apo, Nasho shayati marutaha, Nainam chintanti shastrani, Nainam dahati pavakaha, Nachainam Kleideyanti apo na shoshayati marutaha nainam shintanti shastrani nainam dahati pavakaha na chainam kleideyanti apo na shoshayati marutaha well, I would definitely like to thank, give my thanks to Swamiji for teaching us this verse and teaching us the technique of meditation and to all the patience and love and strength and power he has 
to help humanity and help my mind along with so many other people and have has changed our lives to that pure free forever awareness which is appearing more and more every day I like to cook french fries <laughs> potato chips I like to make tea and dal and vegetables vegetarian I feel very sorry for them and also for the animals that they're eating because the animals they don't want to be killed you, normally people don't even know what they're eating the general public they're, they're having all these meat dishes but they never even saw the eyes of the animal they're eating they just see it nicely packaged or put on a plate with seasoning they don't know what's involved in it and if you ever do go to a play or to a place where an animal is being actually killed look in their eyes they're not saying kill me they're saying please save me and all that fear that goes into the food because the animal knows it's going to be killed even days before it's actually killed but everyone is free to have the diet of their choice and this is the diet of my choice which is a no destruction of the life especially where there is there are eyes that see you and eyes that plead for the life and don't offer themselves to be eaten by you. Namaste dear one.